Okay. Now we're going to talk about post-traumatic stress disorder. The PowerPoint slides for this are also on Canvas. Please look at the slides. Don't look at me. Um, and you see there I list again all of the trauma and stressor-related disorders. I'm going to be talking about post-traumatic stress and acute stress disorder, although I've highlighted <clears throat> the adjustment disorders. That's a category that you should be familiar with. It is discussed in the Comer book, um, and I think they mentioned that it is uh, the single most used diagnosis reported to insurance companies, the 309 point XX diagnosis, which the last two digits uh, depend on whether you diagnose it with depressed mood, with anx anxious mood, with disturbance of conduct, with mixed um, uh, disturbance of emotion and conduct, or unspecified. Um, and it's not so much because adjustment disorder is um, so common as that most clinicians, and I've had this experience myself, uh, feel that it allows them to give a diagnosis to a patient that will result in reimbursement from insurance companies and capture depression or anxiety, which are the two most common uh, problems that people have without giving them an overly stigmatizing diagnosis like major depression or obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, so that's why it's used so often and you obviously should be aware of it and you may need to use it either in one of the film uh, reviews or the take home exam at the end of the quarter. But as I say, I will be focusing on post-traumatic stress disorder and acute stress disorder. Post-traumatic stress disorder is an anxiety reaction to stimuli... Um, pardon me. Wrong. If we have anxiety reactions to stimuli in the normal range of experience, those are classified as adjustment disorders. The one that's closest to PTSD would probably be adjustment disorder with anxious mood. If, on the other hand, you have an anxiety reaction to stimuli which are outside the normal range of experience, which are unusually traumatic, then you would be diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. And over the years, there's been intense debate over just how intense the trauma has to be to qualify as outside the normal range of experience. In DSM-3, uh, the criteria required it to be beyond the range of usual human suffering. DSM-5 has made that more specific. Um, trauma involving exposure to real or threatened death, serious injury, or sexual violence. PTSD can also be coded as delayed if the symptoms do not occur, the full symptoms don't occur, until six months after the trauma. Full symptoms that occur within the first month after the trauma are not diagnosed as PTSD. Those are the symptoms that are diagnosed as acute stress disorder. And we don't give them the diagnosis for the full PTSD unless and until the symptoms last more than one month. Research suggests that about two-thirds of people who are diagnosed with acute stress disorder go on to qualify for PTSD, meaning the symptoms last more than one month. There are five basic criteria for a diagnosis of PTSD. Criteria A is the traumatic stimulus that we've been talking about. Criteria B are intrusive, re-experiencing symptoms. Criteria C, avoidance symptoms. Criteria D, cognitive and mood symptoms. <clears throat> 
and criteria E, arousal symptoms. This is a little bit of a different organization than DSM-4 had, although it's basically looking at the same symptom lineup. So I want to look uh, carefully at the DSM criteria here. That it's quite complicated, so get ready. Um, criteria A, as we've been saying, is exposure to a actual or threatened death, serious injury, or sexual violence in one or more of the following ways. This is the trauma that becomes the uh, source of the later uh, PTSD symptoms. So the person has either directly experienced the traumatic event themselves, uh, rape survivor, combat survivor from a, a war situation, a natural disaster, earthquake, uh, something of that nature, a catastrophic accident like an airplane crash. Uh, these are the kinds of things we're usually talking about. Um, or the person witnessed the event in person as it happened to other people. So maybe you yourself were not almost killed or seriously injured uh, in a horrible accident or disaster or crime, but you were actually physically present and saw it happening in a vivid and gruesome way to somebody else. Uh, you can also qualify for criteria A if you learned about this horrible event actual or threatened death, serious injury or sexual violence, um, happening to a close member of your family or friend. Uh, if it's a death, then it can't be, you know, relatively natural causes or a chronic disease. It would have to be a violent or, or very uh, gruesome accidental death. Or for uh, repeated or extreme exposure to aversive details of the traumatic event. The, what they have in mind here is a first responder, a fireman, a police officer who um, has to spend a lot of time with the remains. You can think of the police officers who dealt with that horrible shooting in the first grade classroom in Connecticut. Um, year and a half ago, and the, uh, think of the police officers who had to go into the classrooms and um, recover the bodies of the children and uh, mark them and so forth. Um, some of those people were later diagnosed with PTSD. This does not apply um, simply to seeing a traumatic event replayed on TV or, you know, on the internet repeatedly unless you're doing it for your work and you're going to have to do it. Criteria B symptoms are one or more of the following intrusion intrusive symptoms associated with the trauma beginning after the event. And there are five possibilities here. You have to have one of these five to qualify for criteria B. Recurrent, involuntary, and intrusive distressing memories uh, of the event, recurrent distressing dreams related to the event, dissociative reactions, they have in mind here flashbacks in which individuals feel or act as if the traumatic event were recurring in, you know, in real time. Uh, this is on a continuum from uh, feeling partly like it's happening but being aware that it's not really happening to some people are actually transported back in time and they uh, have difficulty telling the difference between their current state of affairs and the traumatic event. I uh, have mentioned to several classes a patient I had when I worked at the VA hospital who had been a Vietnam veteran and had uh, taken up basically household in a, in a village in Vietnam with a woman and her son and uh, when he had a chance, he would live with them and sleep with them. And one night, uh, he woke up, and the woman who he thought of as his wife was uh, in the midst of trying to stab him to death. She was actually working with uh, 
I'm not sure if she was working with the um, Viet Cong or the Viet Cong had come to her village and had threatened to harm her or her children if she did not try to kill him. Uh, she, he woke up and his training took over and he killed her uh, very gruesomely. And now he was back in the United States. It was many years later. I think it was 15 years after the fact. And he was still having a number of intrusive symptoms, including the reason he was in therapy with me. He had been required by the police. He had um, a helicopter had shown a light through his window. He lived in Oakland and had woken him up in the middle of the night. He had had a flashback, thought he was back in Vietnam. He slept with his army knife under his bed, under his mattress, and he pulled it out and almost killed his wife. Um, and so he was mandated to be in therapy. That's an example of a, a dissociative reaction or flashback. And I should say, having said that vivid example, most people with PTSD are not violent or dangerous to anybody. Um, and that stigma is becoming a problem with the current uh, generation of um, veterans that we're getting from Iraq and Afghanistan. Fourth uh, intrusive symptom is intense or prolonged psychological distress at exposure to internal or ex external cues that symbolize a traumatic event. For people who served in Vietnam, the sound of a helicopter is a common um, cue that, that does cause anx anxiety and um, distress. And fifth, marked physiological reaction to internal or external cues that symbolize the traumatic event. There's a scene in the movie a Band of Brothers where a guy who spent the uh, was at Bastogne during the Battle of the Bulge during a particularly brutal winter, and um, he mentions that you know 30 and 40 years later, whenever it gets cold, he um, kind of is is taken back to that horrible uh, experience on the line. Criteria C is persistent avoidance of stimuli associated with the trauma. Um, and there's one, there's two possible ways of demonstrating this. You have to have at least one of them. Avoidance of or efforts to avoid distressing memories, thoughts, or feelings associated with a traumatic event. Or two, avoidance of or efforts to avoid external reminders that arouse distressing memories, thoughts, or feelings about the trauma. Uh, so people with PTSD are often purposely trying to distance or numb themselves, avoid thinking about um, the traumatic event. One of the treatments, as we'll see for PTSD, is to try to break through that and extinguish the um, negative response. Criteria D, negative alterations in cognitions and mood associated with trauma, beginning or worsening after the event. And now here, here you have to have two of seven Symptoms, inability to remember an important aspect of the traumatic event, persistent and exaggerated negative beliefs or expectations about self, others, or world, persistent distorted cognitions about the cause or consequences of a traumatic event that lead to blame of self or others, persistent negative emotional state, fear, horror, anger, guilt, shame, markedly diminished interest or participation in significant activities, feelings of detachment or estrangement from others, persistent inability to experience positive emotions. Of course, many of these are symptoms of depression. Um, you need two of these seven to qualify for the PTSD diagnosis. Criteria E, marked, uh, marked alterations in arousal and reactivity associated with the trauma. Uh, you need two of these six symptoms here, irritable behavior, an angry outburst without provocation, reckless or self-destructive behavior, hypervigilance, that means examining the environment closely in kind of a suspicious way, looking for signs of threat, exaggerated startle response, problems with concentration, pardon me, <sighs> Pardon me. And sleep disturbance. Difficulty falling or staying asleep. 
And then there are a number of other criteria. F, the duration criteria is particularly important with PTSD. The duration of the disturbance, which is defined as criteria B, C, D, and E, must um, be more than one month. And again, if it's less than one month, then we diagnose it with acute stress disorder. Um, the disturbance causes clinically significant distress or impairment. H, uh, not attributable to physiological effects of a substance or other medical condition. That can be difficult to judge because often people with PTSD use um, substances to uh, self-medicate, basically, alcohol and drugs. And then we have specifications with dissociative symptoms. You make a note about that. With delayed expression, as we mentioned before, if the full symptoms first develop after uh, six months. I'm not giving you here that the whole another set of special criteria to use in children under the age of six. We won't be dealing with children that young in our films or in our take-home exam, but you should be aware that there are special symptoms for children. Some basic statistics. Uh, prevalence, about 8% of the American population uh, meets the criteria for PTSD uh, at some time in their life. Surprisingly, um, in some cases of trauma, there's relatively few people who develop PTSD. It's a famous study done of survivors of the British Blitz. That's the bombing of London and surrounding areas by Hitler during World War II. And relatively few of the survivors of what was a horrifying um, experience ever developed what we would today call PTSD. On the other hand, other trauma groups have relatively high um, incidences of PTSD. Uh, roughly 33% of rape victims experience PTSD or diagnosed with PTSD, um, which is one reason why DSM-5 specifically notes sexual assault uh, without really um, qualifying it in terms of severity. There's something about the uh, intense personal violation of sexual assault that seems to be close. And I think, I think a lot of it is the loss of, uh, loss of control and powerlessness that goes along with sexual assault. That um, There's some evidence that that lack of control is an important part of the development of the PTSD symptoms. For all trauma together, about 18% across a variety of kinds of traumas, um, serious, severe traumas, develop um, symptoms that meet the criteria for PTSD diagnosis. Some of the factors that seem to determine this is how close the exposure is, the more direct the threat is to your own life or to those of other people you are immediately in proximity to, the more likely and intense the uh, PTSD symptoms will be. There's some evidence of a biological vulnerability for a variety of reasons. Some people be, may be more likely to develop PTSD after experiencing extreme stress and also a psychosocial vulnerability. There's some evidence that people who um, are psychologically healthy uh, and best able to cope with trauma are least likely to develop PTSD. So it may be that one of the predictors of PTSD for people who've experienced severe trauma is what was their general state of their mental health um, prior to that. The course of uh, PTSD is usually chronic if left untreated. One study of a group that did was very vulnerable to PTSD in World War II, not civilians in London during the Blitz, but 84% of American prisoners of war in Japan during World War II uh, were later diagnosed with what we would today call PTSD. 60% um, of them still showed symptoms of the disorder decades, many decades, several decades after uh, the event. Treatment for PTSD. Uh, there is medication that is sometimes used, antidepressant and anti-anxiety drugs. This is mostly to provide symptomatic relief. Uh, 
often with the nightmares and flashbacks, which can be helpful. It's not to put that down. We, we want to give people relief from symptoms. There's no evidence, though, that medication actually decreases the diagnosis of the disorder. It just makes it a little bit easier to tolerate. Overwhelmingly, the evidence is extremely clear. The best treatment for PTSD is exposure therapy, again, which, again, is extinction. Um, after repeated exposures to the conditioned stimulus in the absence of the unconditioned stimulus, the conditioned response tends to diminish. Um, ideally, and most powerfully, we'd have what's called in vivo exposure, where we take the person back to the actual uh, situation or expose them to the actual stimuli associated with the trauma. Often there's practical barriers to doing this, and often there are ethical barriers to doing this. The trauma was so severe that we don't want to actually uh, reinstate the um, original situation. And imagination works pretty well anyway. And so most often when we do exposure therapy with PTSD, we have the patient gradually visualize the uh, original um, situation and event and then get them to, more and more deeply to re-experience that event. At the same time, endeavoring to prevent them from engaging in their various avoidance behaviors, dissociation, distancing responses that they've developed to um, not experience um, the negative feelings. Uh, it's, it's, it's difficult. It takes a little while, not too long, but it, it takes weeks and, and often months uh, of work uh, to get people to experience the emotional event uh, and then realize that the bad thing isn't happening now. They don't have to keep being afraid of it. <clears throat> there, are, there have been some potentially harmful therapies for PTSD. One is critical incident stress debriefing, and the other is EMDR. Critical stress debriefing, or CISD, uh, is listed by uh, one of the divisions, Division 12 of American Psychological Association, which is a division of clinical psychology, as a potentially harmful therapy. It's intended to prevent symptoms of PTSD in those exposed to a traumatic event. Um, typically, it's administered in one long session, three to four hours, kind of a marathon session, in groups of people who were exposed to the same trauma. Clients are encouraged to process their negative emotions. Um, PTSD symptoms are described for them, and uh, they are told that this is what will happen to them if they don't engage in the processing of the negative emotions. And once they begin, they are discouraged from discontinuing uh, the process. Randomly controlled studies of the effectiveness of CISD uh, suggest that it's not effective. Uh, but not only that, it actually can make things worse. Uh, with a couple of studies showing that trauma survivors who were given CISD after the trauma were actually more likely to develop PTSD than those who did not. Uh, and it may be that the intervention so soon after the trauma is in some ways encouraging uh, heightened processing of the trauma, which then leads to a stronger avoidance reaction uh, down the line. Eye movement desensitization and reprocessing therapy, EMDR, is the most controversial psychotherapeutic treatment developed in the recent uh, decades of psychotherapy. It was developed by a woman named Francine Shapiro in 1987. She noticed that while thinking about a distressing event in her own life and moving her eyes back and forth rapidly, her distress was decreased. Shapiro is not a psychologist. She's, a, I believe, a marriage and family therapist. And she decided to use the same technique with her own clients. Uh, and the basic technique she uses is to have her patient form an image of whatever trauma they've been dealing with, generate both negative and positive thoughts about the trauma, uh, 
while the therapist moves um, his or her finger back and forth uh, in front of the patient and the patient is instructed to track the moving finger with their eyes. Uh, the theory is that somehow the eye movement uh, kind of speeds up integration and processing of the traumatic memories in the brain. Uh, there are many therapists, Shapiro reported this on her, I think through email first, and then she, of course, got a web page, and then there have been publications. And many therapists have used her method and reported very sudden and dramatic improvement with their patients, though, of course, these are what we call anecdotes or stories. In this case, the anecdotes have been backed up by more controlled studies. Patients that get EMDR clearly do tend to get better. There isn't any controversy about that. The controversy is over whether the eye movements is an active ingredient in the therapy that actually improves a response to treatment. Most of the well-controlled studies that have compared EMDR to exposure therapy have found that while EMDR is more effective than nothing, than a control, a, a no treatment control group, it is not more effective than exposure therapy alone without the eye movements. So when EMDR works, uh, it most likely is because it's exposure therapy. You're getting the patient to think about and remember the traumatic event in the absence of anything bad happening to them. It may be that the belief in the eye movements is a helpful way of uh, getting them to not focus on the harm that could be done, but the same thing could be happening could happen from teaching them to relax, which is a pretty straightforward and easy tool. It's a big fight, though. Many therapists still believe that the eye movements is a necessary part of the treatment and leads to faster and better improvement. There are a number of uh, studies about this. I've listed three of them there on the PowerPoint slide for you. Most kind of scientific therapists or evidence-based therapists regard EMDR as a pseudotherapy. It itself doesn't harm anything. There's no damage that comes to people by moving their fingers back and forth in front of their eyes. And so you might think no harm, no foul, what's the big deal? Except uh, there are some opportunity costs where um, clients seek out an EMDR therapist rather than another therapist who might be more ethical or better trained, more effective in ways that do actually work. And then I've given you an abstract from a, the Davidson and Parker study uh, in 2001, which was published in, one, in the, the flagship clinical journal of uh, psychology, the Journal of Consulting and Clinical Psychology. You can look up that article and read the whole thing if you're interested, or just read the summary there that describes the, the controlled study that is pretty, I think, convincing. And that's it. That brings us to the end of our lecture about PTSD, which also brings me to my end of my lectures that will be covered on the first exam. Remember, the first exam is going to be Wednesday at, I believe, 1220. Make sure you go to the library computer room, get there early, log on to the lockdown browser, um, get to the password page, Jenny Lee will be there. She will give you the password at exactly 1220. You will have 45 minutes to complete the test. Um, then the test will turn off, of course. So uh, remember to review the book. There will be questions over the assigned reading that I have not talked about in class. That goes for the Comer textbook, the Saws um, Myth of Mental Illness, and the Chesler Women in Madness. Uh, questions in the book that I did not talk about in class will be on the test as multiple choice. Essay questions will only be from material that I've talked about in class.
either from the standard psychiatric model and the anxiety disorders we've talked about so far, or anxiety-related disorders, or um, questions from Saws and Schessler that we talked about in class. And that material is summarized on the study sheet that is on Canvas. So good. Oh, also remember to watch the movie Tuesday night at 8 o'clock. As I make this on Sunday night, I still don't know where that movie is going to be shown. We're having a bit of a problem with that, but I hope to get that clarified Monday morning, and I will post that on Canvas before I leave. And then watch the video. I'll make one more video here before I go to sleep tonight um, to help you um, think through the uh, As Good As It Gets film and to prepare to write the first diagnostic film review, um, which I believe is due is it Friday, whatever the syllabus says. All right, good. That was a little bit shorter. It's 31 minutes now. And good luck on the test, and I will see you when I get back on Friday.